Several years ago, I had a good friend who was going through something very difficult in his life. Um, and he was having a tough time, like many of us would understand, um, making the right choice, choosing to do what he knew was right in the midst of a hard situation. And I encouraged him to think about, you know, our Lord Jesus Christ knew what it was like. And my friend, in the midst of his frustration, responded, well, it was easy for him because he was God. <clears throat> and I said, you misunderstand who Jesus Christ was during his earthly ministry. <coughs> I'm Pastor Tim Holscher. We are looking at or trying to answer the question, what is man? Right now we're looking at man's physical existence, our physical body, this physical nature. And we're taking just a little bit of time here to look at some things about our Lord Jesus Christ with regard to this physical nature. And I do believe that there are quite a few misunderstandings. People tend to go to extremes on lots of things. So there are people on the one extreme that that emphasize the fact that Jesus is man almost to, to the exclusion of, or sometimes if they're unbelievers, ex, uh, totally denying the fact that he, he was God. But there are many Christians that really don't understand what he was as God in that regard. And so they emphasize his humanity over that. And then there are people on the other side that emphasize his deity so much that they have problems with the fact that he really was a man. And the things that he went through as a man were very real and, and genuine. Here in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8 and then verse 9 in particular, talking about Christ, it says, For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in a bodily form or bodily. When he came down here, he really did manifest what he was as God, but he also was genuinely a man. Philippians chapter 2, which is a very important text, tells us that when he became a man, he says in verse 6, who although he existed in the form of God, notice that he was existing in the, the special unique possession of the form of God, he did not regard or lead his mind, consider with his mind, equality with God, a thing to be grasped. Like he had to seize this and go, I won't let go of this, I won't let go of this. He was willing to let go of that. And when it says equality here, I don't believe he's using the word equality with the sense that, well, he's not God, but I believe that it's talking about the free exercise of what he was as God, that he didn't have to take orders for some people. There are some people that misunderstand, uh, genuine believers, genuine Christians, that misunderstand the nature of the Trinity, and they think that the Father's always the one that's in charge and that the Son and the Spirit always do his bidding. And they don't understand, and this is one of the passages that would relate to this, that in reality, the, the Trinity are absolutely equal, not just in terms of their nature, but even, even in terms of the exercise of who they are and in the decision-making process. But when Christ came down here and became a man, he gave up that free exercise, which is what we have in verse 7. It says, but he emptied himself and took the form of a, what does it say there, a bondservant or a slave. Most of us would go, what's a bondservant? It's a slave is the way I would translate it because that's what the word doulos emphasized. It emphasized a person who functioned as a slave. And we have that term many times throughout the New Testament. And so being made in the likeness of a man. And it didn't mean there were people that misunderstood this and thought, well, he, he wasn't genuinely a man. There were people, even in the time that the New Testament was being written with uh, John writing, they thought that Jesus just appeared to be a man. Man, but he wasn't really a man. It wasn't genuine. It wasn't real. It was just kind of a, some of them just a ghostly apparition or something, just a very temporary type of substance. There were different perspectives that people held on this because they emphasized his deity so much. And that's really interesting that one of the early heresies, today we struggle with trying to convince people Jesus was God. But in the early century, one of the things they had problems with was convincing people he was also really man because some of the people that were heretics, they wanted to emphasize so much that he was God that they denied that he ever became man. And both of those are true. And it tells us there, he was in the existence of God's, of the former, the nature of God. But he emptied himself, became a slave, became like us. This is what we're looking at. 
So when Jesus Christ came down here and became a man in this way, we looked at this verse yesterday. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. God, the Father, not the Son himself, but the Father in this case, prepares a body. I would say also in combination with the work of the Spirit, and we saw that in Luke the other day. All of this then means that when he comes down here, John 1 one, talking about the fact that he is the Word, he's facing a person who is God, he himself is God. And then we're just going to skip over this. It's a loaded passage, so I don't want to get bogged down too much. But in verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. So he came down here and he shone. He demonstrated life, eternal life, God's kind of life. In terms we could understand, taking on a physical nature. And then he later in his earthly ministry in John 8, 12, he leaves this promise with his disciples, a promise that has bearing for us because it's a, really would say it's a promise for us too. John 8, 12, he says, then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of of life or the light that consists of life. In other words, we shine by exercising this life. We were looking, if you remember just the other day, at the fact that there's good, I think there's evidence that Adam and Eve in their initial creation, though they were, though we would say that they were actually physically naked, they had no items of clothing on, they did shine. They had some sort of a radiance about them. That's lost when they fall. That, that aspect of the image of God is lost. But now you and I, in part, are able to demonstrate that again by possessing eternal life. And when we live that out as light, we shine. But it's not a visible light. It's a, well, it's not what we would think of as a light, like the light coming in through my window or from my ceiling or anything like that. It's, it's a light that consists of life, living out life that shines in a different way. Um, sometimes we even use it that way. When a person does something rather extraordinary, he said, boy, you really shone. You were really shining. And we're not talking at all about some light as we think from a light source. We're talking about excellent activity, excellent job at, at what they were doing. Now, all of this then comes down to, to a promise uh, that we can actually use this. And I want to go to Titus chapter 1, and I, we've been over this, I'm sure, in other studies. I couldn't tell you exactly when it was, but in Titus chapter 1, Paul, a, a slave of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge or the full experience of knowledge of, and, and this isn't the truth, it's just knowledge of truth, which is according to or measured by the standard of godliness. In other words, godliness measures this truth. Now, I think we've talked about this word godliness before, and we're kind of stuck with it because it's a word that that we have in many, almost all of our translations. I don't know of translations that don't use this. Sometimes they use maybe pious or piety uh, in, in place of this. But it's a word literally that we meant to honoring a God well. You honor a God well. God gives us certain things. And when we use those things as God intends us to use them, we're honoring him well. Okay, So in here then, he goes on, and you can see I've X'd out the in because I don't think in is a good translation. It's according to the hospital, <laughs> according to, excuse me, godliness. And then in verse 2, in is actually the preposition, and you can see it over there on the far side if you read Greek, it's the preposition epi which looks like an E and the Greek letter pi. Uh, and if you've ever taken math, you've seen pi before. Epi, which means to be upon, to rest upon. And so he says this godliness, I would say, rests upon the hope of eternal life. Now, this isn't the hope of getting it. We have eternal life. We're not going to go over and review that. We have eternal life. But we have the hope that we can use that eternal life, that we can manifest that, just as Jesus said in John 8. We can have this light that consists of life. And when we use God's life well, well, we honor him well. When we use eternal life the way he wants us to use eternal life, 
in doing good and exercising love and being patient and long-suffering in situations, we are honoring God well. Are you honoring God well? And if you're a believer, you have eternal life. Are you using that eternal life? Are you loving the believers that are around you? Are you taking time with them to connect, to be used to encourage them, to interact? We are just having a conversation with friends this morning. And uh, we have, you know, these things here, these smartphones. And those smartphones have made us not very smart when it comes to social interaction. And not very smart when it comes to the way that we really care for people. We need to interact. We need more face-to-face -face interaction with people. I, I appreciate those of you that tune in and listen to this, but I can guarantee this Bible study is not a substitute for being engaged with other believers. You need to be face-to-face -face where you have time to talk with, listen to other believers. Uh, sometimes, and I struggle with as much as the next, opening my mouth and just running at the mouth with other people instead of just listening to other people, listening to other believers, and then sharing with them too. So all of this, this is the way that we honor God well because we're using eternal life in our interaction with people down here. Now all of this, you'd say, well, what does this have to do with the, with the body? I want to go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16. By common confession, or I would say agreeably, this is it's a form of the word confess, it's a, as an adverb. So agreeably, we'd look at this. Great is the mystery of godliness, or great is the mystery of honoring God well. Now when we read the word mystery, when Paul uses the word mystery, or Jesus uses it, or John uses it in Revelation, mystery always refers to something that at that time, when it is being called a mystery initially, it was something new. It was not an old truth. It wasn't a truth. So when Paul mentions this, you can't go back and find godliness in the Old Testament. Now, I can guarantee you, if you look in a lot of English Bibles, you're going to find the, the English word godly. But the idea, the biblical idea of godliness, of honoring God well in the way that, that Paul is explaining it here, was something new. And it was new for a number of reasons. One of those being that we, that is believers in the body of Christ, are the first group of people in history to possess eternal life while we're breathing the air. Israel in the Old Testament, we've been over this, and I'm not going to prove this again, but they were promised that they would get eternal life when they were resurrected. So they lived this life without eternal life, but they, were going to, they knew that they would get it in the future. Remember when Jesus, when Lazarus had died, Jesus says, well, your brother will live again. And his, one of his sisters says, well, I know he'll live in the resurrection in the last day. I believe that. And see, in connection with that resurrection, those people believed that they would get eternal life. Resurrection was not equivalent to eternal life, but they would get it at that time. And so he's talking about this mystery. You and I have this privilege that has now been revealed that we can honor God well because we've been given eternal life. And so he mentions this mystery of godliness, and then he says, he who was, and some of your Bibles say, uh, God was manifest. There is, a, there is an issue that involves a uh, little word over on the other side. And uh, it, I'll be honest, it's one that, that I have gone back and forth on whether it's he who was revealed in flesh or whether God was manifest in flesh. I know I'd probably like the God one. In fact, that little word over on the far side, and I can't get my finger all the way, but all the way over there on the far side in the Greek, and it looks like an O and an S. And that O, if you put a little line through it, let me see if I can, This it's this word right here. And in the Greek, it looks like this letter, believe it or not. And that line has been, has been written through that in one of the Greek texts that we have, the, the ancient Greek texts. And then you can see that somebody has come along with a, with a knife and scratched out that center line, which has changed this from a, from a theta to an omicron. And the theta sigma is the abbreviation for God, a common abbreviation for God in a lot of old man, Greek manuscripts. So I'm just trying to say, some of your Bibles may have God as manifest in flesh. Uh, the Greek text I'm using here um, says, he who is revealed in flesh. And that's the whole point. This mystery of godliness is being revealed in flesh. It's that in this physical body, you can actually manifest flesh. You can live it out. 
Now, why is that important? Well, he's going to go through and he's going to name uh, these six things about Jesus Christ and the things that have been said. But the whole point of all that is those things to a limited degree are related even to what God can do through us. And so my friend that said that's easy for him, they're neglecting the fact that Jesus, living out flesh, still had to depend on God the Father in many ways, the way we depend on God the Father. And he depended on the Holy Spirit. In many ways, as we depended on the Holy Spirit or depend on the Holy Spirit. And the result of that is, is that just as he demonstrated that just because you're a physical being, you got this physical nature down here, does not prevent you from living or using eternal life. It does not prevent you from honoring God well in this physical nature. Yes, it's fallen at the present time, but it doesn't prohibit us from honoring God. And I think that that's another takeaway. When we look, we think at the Christmas time of God coming in flesh, we think of Jesus Christ being born, but part of one of the things for us as a takeaway from this is he demonstrated by becoming a man like us, demonstrated God can still be honored well, even in this physical existence. Probably can't emphasize enough how important it is for us to realize that. And we're not doing it of ourselves. We're doing it because of what God's given us. Because he's given us eternal life. We have that within us. Because God the Son's in it. Because he's in us. We have eternal life. That's 1 John 5, 11 and 12 if you've never looked at that. And when we live that eternal life out, loving other believers, engaging as God desires, we are honoring God well. And that is that word that's translated godliness in our English Bibles. Hope that encourages you. Something else to think about in this holiday season when everybody's thinking about Jesus and baby Jesus to remember. But it's not just that he was a baby, but that as a man he grew and he did these different things. He did these activities. Vindicated in spirit. That means the Holy Spirit set up his temptation to demonstrate that he was genuinely righteous. We read that in the Gospels. The Spirit drove him for the purpose of being tempted. The Spirit doesn't do that with us, but he did do that with him. And he was seen by the angels. The angels witnessed the temptation, and they witnessed what he did and what he went through. And he was proclaimed among the nations. And they didn't just go around proclaiming, hey, there's a good man, there's a good man, but they're proclaiming who he was and what he was manifesting, how he was demonstrating. And Because of that, he was believed on in the world. Now, our lives ought to say something about him, and it ought to encourage people to believe in Jesus Christ and then taken up in glory. And we're looking for that. You and I have the opportunity to be demonstrating that glory, to live that out. So there's a lot of parallels between what he demonstrated and what was true as people responded to what they saw and what God can be doing through you and I today. Encourage you. Something to really think about as we look at to Christmas. And with that, I encourage you as always to have a good day in the Lord. And I want to thank you for joining me.